and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. This show is the state of the state of Hawaii, and I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll-Dalton. Um, during the Honolulu Mayor's Campaign, this show interviewed uh, many, most of the candidates. Uh, and the primary election happened, and that gave us two finalists for the executive position in the state. I guess it's the third highest executive position, or, or maybe it's the second, but it's a high executive position. So the primary election um, you know, gave us those people that we now can examine. Now, now that it's just those two, we're going to take time in this show to examine what uh, competencies and skills the mayoral leadership role requires. And uh, that, that can help us uh, think about uh, what's required, uh, mandated almost by what's presented, and and help decide our votes for one of these fine candidates if you haven't voted already. I think some of us have already received a ballot, but things are going on right now. So this is a good time to get a little more um, insight into what, what it takes to do these things from an expert on governing and uh, policy that we're gonna talk with today. And uh, his, uh, he is an associate, and that guest today is, is Dr. Colin Moore, and uh, he is an associate professor at the UH Manoa, and he directs there the policy, the public policy center. So Dr. Moore is here with us to do this discussion because he has scholarly expertise in the areas that um, are, are challenging the whole nation. And he's also looked uh, closely at Hawaii's situation too. So we've got somebody that knows the big picture and then knows um our big picture too. I was going to say little picture, but we're little in size, but our picture is big. So um, welcome, Professor Colin Moore. Thanks, Stephanie. Great to be here. Great. I'm so glad to, that you can come and share with us uh, from your point of view and your expertise um, more about what, what city county is facing, what we're all going through. I mean, we're all involved in this process mostly to vote and hopefully um, everybody is in that. But even if they're not, we're all on the receiving end, right? Of who's going to be in this role. So what does it take and what are they going to do? So, um, you know, I assume, of course, that COVID-19 has ha added another layer to your, your study about governing and pu public policy. So, um, but given the mayors, um, that the mayors must cope with all all current and any new challenge that arises, even one as big as COVID-19. Um, do you, can you say if you think or anybody thinks that the mayor's role is the most stressful governing role in the state? I mean, in other words, like more than the, than the governor. I mean, because of the level, maybe just a little background on how that works. Sure. So, so being mayor of a city like Honolulu, and obviously I've never been mayor, but I, I know people have worked in those offices. And you know, the, the thing about being a mayor is that it's a nonstop job. In other words, you, you really are constantly just solving problems. It's not an ideological job, usually. No one looks to you to kind of make broad policy statements and certainly take ideological positions in the way they might in the US Congress or even as governor. Um, there are potholes to be filled and there are city services that need to be provided. And, you know, I think most mayors sort of just think of themselves as solving this string of problems constantly. Um, but COVID adds a new level of complexity to that. So it may not be the, the most stressful job. I think in a post-COVID environment, probably being the governor is the most stressful job because ultimately you're the one who's going to be uh, who has to deal with um, the more immediate tax issues, trying to interface with the federal government and our congressional delegation um, and handle the state legislature. But certainly being mayor of the biggest city would be the second most stressful job. Um, and they're gonna have to confront a number of challenges. First will be the huge drop off in revenue. Um, although the city is primarily financed by property taxes, there's gonna be a lot of people and businesses who aren't able to pay those property taxes. So there's gonna be a big drop off in revenue. At the same time, there's a need for more city services, emergency services, 
um, and, and things of, of that nature. So it's going to be a real challenge. And then on top of all of that, of course, um, is the perennial issue for the mayor of the city and county, which is rail. Um, now, technically, the city is um, that rail is managed by Hart, but the city is a major partner with this. Um, and exactly what will happen to Hart um, is going to be, you know, one of the biggest questions for whoever becomes mayor um, in um, or who's elected mayor in a few weeks. I, I did hear that rail was the number two problem after the number one problem, which was homelessness. But evidently, most believe that the COVID-19 has superseded that and, and is now number one. The others still, I guess, stay in train. But, um, well, you know, speaking of these two people, um, we have in alphabetical order, uh, we have got um, um, Amamiya, Mr. Amamiya, a uh, former litigator um, who's worked now, who's working now in, in insurance. Um, and, um, and then we have Rick Blangiardi, who's who's got a lot of experience uh, in leadership in in media, actually, right? And as a former football player and a coach at the UH, so um, my 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 interest in what they have in common and is, of course, that they're inexperienced and they have no record. They have no political record yet. Okay, they're making it now, and of course, Rick Blangiardi got ahead of of uh, Amamiya, you know, by a chunk of, chunk of votes. But um, the other part that they um, share, the other commonality they share is that they both come out of athletics mm -hmm. and at different points in their careers. But uh, there is an age difference, but who knows? They might've been doing the same thing at the same time athletically. But anyway, I was just wondering, um, since that is, uh, seen of, to be a feature, and I think that's attractive to the state because of the interest here, especially in high school football as well as the UH. And anyway, I think that uh, I wanted to know if you thought that um, that makes sense. <laughs> that athletics <laughs> is is a basis for skill sets or competencies that they're uh, going to need in this job, and um, is. In other words, what does it have to do with being mayor? Anything? Sure, that's that's an interesting question. I've 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 wondered the same thing myself. I mean, that is the one the one common thread uh, that ties them together. That uh, Rick Blangiardi was a a football coach at the UH years and years ago, and of course Keith Amamiya ran the high school athletics league. Um, you know, partially I think their orientation to athletics and what it brings to their candidacy are are two somewhat different things. I mean, Rick Blangiardi is really running on his experience as a businessman, but also his experience as, um, as someone who gets things done. And he often uses, um, he often talks about himself like a coach, although he doesn't coach football anymore. He coaches employees. Um, he turns businesses around. I mean, that's sort of, even the way he presents himself, he still looks like a football coach. He kind of talks like one. Um, and, um, and I think he's trying to use that message to say, you know, I'm, I'm the guy who can give you some tough love. I can, I can organize people and motivate them and turn things around. Keith Amamiya does not present himself so much as a coach, I think, as um, use his experience in athletics in Hawaii to show that he has deep connections in the community, um, that he can go and, and talk to people and find um, kind of mutually beneficial um, solutions to their problems, um, that he is a close listener um, and he is not going to, to tell you what to do, but maybe to try to lead you uh, uh, along a path where, where everyone can get along. So they have very different approaches to leadership, both tied into athletics, but, um, but for Amami, it's much more based in his knowledge in the community and his listening skills. And I think for Rick Blangiardi, it's much more about being a coach and trying to motivate employees or, you know, maybe to some extent, all the, the residents of the city and county. So um, in that, this seems that then Rick Blangiardi is doing more of a process thing, uh, a relationship building thing, the things that you do to make these teams happen. And um, that, that's very compelling, uh, it would seem. That, and so I see now what you're saying is bringing that out of his athletic world into the businessman's role that he's had. And that's what he talks about it being. And so 
that that's absolutely right. I mean, he's really running on his experience and he has some very significant business experience. I mean, more outside of Hawaii than inside of Hawaii, although he always says he thinks of this as his home, but he's run some very, very large companies. And I think that's something voters find attractive. Well, I think that uh, taking on Telemundo, that uh, Spanish language station across the country, which is very important to many, many hundred thousands of people, and um, and he doesn't even speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> So that was very interesting that, that it shows you where what's important, you know, kind of what we're getting to in the talk here is what what is it down under there? I mean, on the surface, it looks like it's one way, but underneath it, it's more complicated, you know, and there are other kinds of things that are in play in terms of capacity and, and skills. I mean, like Rick's not knowing Spanish did not inhibit in any way his being a huge success for Telemundo. Right. You no. Know? So now um, we we have Keith and um, and he's um, he's doing his work with um, the he's bringing. How do you see? Can you talk about Keith a little bit and how he might be using it and in his insurance as a businessman in the areas he's working in, Keith. Sure. I mean, I think that, I mean, I think, again, this is, you know, this, uh, you know, he's never, he's never been an executive in the same way, but I think he has always been someone who listens carefully, um, who's respectful of people and their problems. Um, and I think that's probably been uh, a part of his success in, in business and in insurance. Um, he, um, he, he's also done a couple of other unique things in the campaign that uh, differ a little bit from how Blangiardi is running it, which maybe I'll I'll mention briefly. Which is the first thing is, and this always happens in the the Honolulu mayor's race. Um, it, although this is a nonpartisan race, it always becomes a little bit partisan. This is just politics, and and Keith has been very quick to remind voters that he's a Democrat, that he's always been a Democrat. He's really wrapped himself in the in the flag of the Democratic Party, which is probably wise and good politics because there are always suspicions that Blanchardi was a Republican or more conservative. And, you know, this goes to his businessman image. And, and the Amamiya campaign actually ran some negative ads um, that made this direct comparison to Rick Blanchardi and President Trump, um, you know, trying to take Blanchardi, um, you know, I think reputation for being kind of a kind of aggressive, kind of outspoken, um, and, and turn hit what Blangiardi has tried to present as a strength, his coach-like um, you know, leadership abilities as a possible liability by comparing him to someone like President Trump who doesn't seem to listen to anyone and, and kind of take a, a my way or the highway approach. I don't actually think that's been all that successful for the Amamiya campaign. Um, I can't fault them for trying. This, this is politics. And as an old time politician once said, politics ain't beanbag. But, um, it, um, it's still, um, I, I don't think it's worked. I think that people have not found this comparison compelling. Um, what would be an example of that, that you know? Of an you example know? Of, um, of this comparison to Trump? Yeah, and, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I well, mean, they, they ran an ad that made that comparison directly, basically saying that we don't need a, a media mogul um, coming into the city and county and telling people what to do. Um, so that was an ad they've ran where they've made that, that explicit comparison. Well, and then that, uh, okay. So, so that was the, um, Keith, uh, Amamiya side coming on against him like that. Right. right. And then, I mean, uh, Rick went out on the limb, Rick Blangiardi kind of went out by revealing who he voted for in the presidential election. I thought, that was interesting. He's we, he's kind of pulled it back now, but do you see that as playing any role in his uh, his uh, run Potentially, potentially. I mean, he he is. Um, you know, one one of the things that makes this race unique too, in a different non-COVID environment, um, I think Amamiya would probably be doing better than I expect that he is, um, but. Um, I think that there is this desperate need in a time of crisis who's, for someone who looks authoritative. And um, I think Blanchiardi um, projects that image in a stronger fashion than Amamiya, who um, uh, has run a campaign based around, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, empathy um, and showing that he understands problems, he um, understands the community, he's there to, to listen closely. I think that this environment favors someone, um, a candidate a little more like Blangiardi. And so I think whatever the people have questions about his political affiliations, that has not ended up being important as it might have been in, in a different, uh, in different political environment. Well, do you see much difference between their positions on rail? I mean, it seems like they're saying that they're going to do this, the, the same thing. They're, they're I, almost exactly the same. I mean, Blanchard used to be far more critical of rail. He is um, somehow uh, become uh, much less critical. This may or may not have something to do with the fact that he's endorsed by the Carpenters Union. Um, but a lot of his criticism about rail has sort of fallen off. I mean, he's moved pretty aggressively to the center in this race. Um, and, um, and, and so I, I don't really think there's really any difference, not that I can see in their two positions on rail. Um, I mean, this, this campaign isn't really about policy. Um, and so you can, you can try to look at their different policy positions, um, but that's not what voters are thinking about. Um, you know, they're not reading detailed policy briefs. And, and so they're voting based on who they trust. And that's what this campaign has been about. I mean, it's really about who these people are rather than what they're saying they're going to do. And I think partly this is because of COVID, partly because you know, the sort of coverage we normally get for the mayor's race has just been crowded out. Um, so it's much more about personality than, than policy um, for, for both candidates. And, and in this environment, I think that benefits Rick Blangiardi, who does not have as many developed policy positions as Keith Amamiya. Okay, so they have put, in fact, Rick had to be pressed to get his plan up there. And it's he did. short on, yeah. yeah. But the, um, the Keith plan, Keith Amamiya's plan was also short on details, but he did have, he did have it up there, which it has a name. Um, yeah, well, do you agree with, given that, um, do you agree that that Rick Blangiardi um, is a more independent thinker? He's been praised for coming up with uh, novel or creative approaches to issues that have uh, the city council's been dealing with, and he's shared ideas with them. And I've seen some statements that were praise, praising his ability to do the kind of out of the box thinking about how to solve problems. Is that? Potentially, um, I think that I mean I think that he also has almost no experience in government, um, right. and so that um, I, I mean I'm not sure there's always a full realization of of what are the you know what is possible and what might not be possible, and I think that if he wins this election, he's going to have to get up to speed really quickly because you're not because running a government agency or a city is not like running a business. And it doesn't matter how many people say that they think it should be. It just isn't. You're dealing with unions. You're dealing with a city council. Um, if you go in there and you try to just, um, and you try to lead, um, you know, uh, uh, lead from, lead from the, the, the top um, at, without the sort of careful consultation uh, that you would do normally in, in government, you're not going to get very far. Um, you know, you might, you, you might be able to, to, to make a lot of noise, but you're not going to make a whole lot happen. Well, what, um, in the case of um, then making structural changes, I know there's been some suggestions that struck, there need to be some structural change. And of course, I'm sure there are many of them that need to be done after the COVID. But, but especially uh, one that's come up is that it's only Honolulu that has like no health department and no, um, no office of health recommendation, what have you. So um, to make some kind of a structural change, I'm sure there are other areas where it's the same too. Does, does Rick Langiardi's style make that a, a more process oriented change rather than a top down, speaking of a top down kind of thing? I mean, I, so what, how do you think they'll do under the press to make structural changes in the government? It's going to be very, very difficult for either of them. I mean, th th those sort of changes in an environment of scarce resources, um, it's, um, I mean, it would really test anyone's leadership abilities. And a part of this, I mean, what's unknown is what sort of city council they're going to have to work with. I mean, 
Mayor Caldwell, who didn't until the very end of his term face COVID, had a terrible relationship with the, with the city council until very recently. I mean, they were constantly at war, which meant a lot of what he wa wanted to do, he wasn't able to do. Um, and so part of whether Amami or Blanchard is elected, part of their success will be who else is going to sit on this council and their relationship with them and whether it's supportive or um, antagonistic. And, uh, and that will really dictate what they're, what they're able to do. And I think a smart mayor will go in there um, and try to immediately work with the city council and try to allow them to take credit for some of these changes. But um, it's, it's tough to lead um, at a time of resource scarcity because uh, you don't have much to work with. Um, you're probably going to have to uh, implement pay cuts, which will anger unions. Um, you know, the, the, um, it, it's, it's um, in a real crisis, sometimes that can work. If, you know, very, very talented leaders can make that work for them. Um, but I, I think it, I, I think the, the jury's out. I think, I think either Amamiya or Blangiardi have, have had some real leadership successes in their careers. So, um, I think, I, I think it's kind of, it, it's hard to tell until they're there because they've never held political office before. Um, so like you said, at the beginning of this, we, we don't really have any way to, to judge their, their success. And these executive positions can be unique to even, you know, there's many cases where you have very talented legislators who have a lot of government experience who move into an executive position and just are no good at it. Um, you know, they're, they're much better at, at um, um, you know, at, at fighting the good fight in the legislature than in the executive, where it's really far more important to compromise, to try to understand what various sides want. Um, and that can be a very different skill set. Well, what, yeah. I, and in fact, for instance, uh, they're both talking about public private partnerships and all that sort of thing. But one of my questions is how can they work with the state? I mean, there's a particular governor there now. But, and, and that's been an interesting uh, uh, you know, um, performance of their relationship. But now it might get really down to um, scratch because if we do, I mean, obviously we're not getting any money right now, but eventually the Fed's gonna probably have to do something about supporting states. And so when that happens, th the state's desperate. So what is it that the mayor's gonna have to do? What does it take? to get that relationship in, in place to be able to really work some deals? Or is it possible or not possible? How do those two roles match? Or well, this potentially could be a problem with electing someone with no government experience, although I'm sure Rick Blangiardi would say he has experience making deals, just not in government. Um, you know, it'll require the mayor to have a close relationship with our congressional delegation. Um, you know, Governor Ige is so unpopular now that I expect that he is going to almost be cut out of a lot of this. I mean, well, you can only do that to a certain extent, but I would say for the mayor, the more important relationship are, is their relationship with the Speaker of the House, um, the House Finance Chair, Sylvia Luke, um, the Senate, um, and the Senate Ways and Means Chair, Donovan Dela Cruz. Those actually will probably be more important relationships going forward because the governor has put himself in a position where he's so unpopular um, that he doesn't have the ability to really move public opinion. He certainly doesn't have any influence in the legislature. Um, so I'm not sure how much, even if they did have a close relationship with the governor, I'm not sure how much of an ally he would be. I would actually at this point look to their relationship with the legislature. That's really interesting. Now, is that a decent question that about the mayor and the and the governor as I asked it? I mean, was or or was that a naive? Um... No, no. I think normally that would be a very important relationship to have. I mean, someone who was very close to the governor, but although Kirk Caldwell is very close to Governor Ige, um, that wasn't always necessarily true, but it became true while they were mayor and governor, and um, Mayor Caldwell uh, helped him a lot in his reelection campaign. Um, I don't know how much that's really helped uh, the mayor um, so far. Um, and he has a much more contentious relationship with the leadership in, in the legislature. So normally, normally that would be a key role, but, but governors, much like presidents, uh, when they are, you know, have terrible approval ratings, as Governor Ige does, um, that means they lose a lot of their political power um, and it means that they're just not in a good position to um, 
to, to advocate for the things the city will need, which eventually will have to come from the legislature in terms of appropriations. And then also our congressional delegation is gonna play a big role here. And I don't, I don't know the relationship um, uh, Blangiardi has. I know that Amamiya has a very close relationship with Senator Schatz. Um, so that would be a real point in his favor. Yeah, the senior senator. Yeah, okay. That's the that's really interesting. Well, I, you know, both of them are going on and on about not raising taxes, and that includes uh, their goals for rail. They they're they're both saying it should go to Manoa, but you know, it's only going to probably get to uh, wherever it's going to get to, and 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 for that there and and maybe it's going to be wherever it's going to get to because they're very reluctant to raise any tax or to say that they're going to raise any taxes that's going to help us get that rail here to, uh, into midtown. Down. But what I wanted to ask you from your studies, what are the pressures that come in to drive uh, politicals and people in these um, elected offices to do something they said they wouldn't do? I mean, George Bush did this, not going to raise taxes, and then, of course, he was up against it. So with these, these two, it's very likely that they're going to be up against it, too in that role. So what, what is it that makes them go against what they said, especially in our community, which is relatively small comparatively? Part of it's just need. I mean, part of it is, is that they sometimes don't even have a choice. I mean, no politician wants to raise taxes. That's rarely a popular position, especially at the city and county level. Um, they, they may be in a position where they have no choice. Um, you know, if they, the city simply can't survive, doesn't have the revenue without that. Now they'd have to do it in a very, a very careful way. I mean, property taxes, raising property taxes is the third rail of Hawaii politics. And we have some of the lowest property tax rates in the country, although the, um, because property values are so high, people actually pay quite a bit in property taxes, but can, but as a percentage, it's very low. But raising that would be the last thing the mayor would want to do. I, I honestly think that they really are both banking on a big bailout from the federal government for both rail and for the city. And if that hap doesn't happen, I don't know what the plan will be. I think it will be, um, it will, they will be in a very, very tough position. I, I, I'm honestly not sure what, what they will do without that. I mean, there's only so much revenue the city can raise and increasing property taxes or increasing taxes generally in an environment like this is a terrible a fiscal decision. Well, do you see them acting differently with regard to uh, being compassionate and more generous with um, cultural communities that are um, minority? Uh, do you see maybe we getting close to time ending here, but maybe if you can say anything about helping um, these communities that are so um, hit hard by COVID and without resources. You no, know, I think they both will show tremendous compassion. They both care deeply about this community. I don't think there's really a distinction there you can draw, but I think they do have different approaches. And I think Blangiardi's approach is more um, kind of coach direct leadership and Amamiya really is more about close listening. Well, okay. I, uh, you know, we're at Aloha time here, and uh, and means we'll have to wrap it up, Colin. So um, I'm Stephanie Stoll Dalton. This is the Think Tech Show, the State of the State of Hawaii, and uh, we've been talking with Dr. Colin Moore from UH Manoa, the director of uh, Public Policy Center, and uh, I'll see you again in two weeks on the next date of the state of Hawaii. So mahalo to Colin Moore and uh, also for all of your attention uh, in the audience. Thank you. Aloha.